Well, today we're going to start talking about virtue ethics. Um, we've been discussing role regulation theory, or relationship regulation theory, and the way in which different relationship models govern our conception of virtue and also our conception of norms. We began talking about advantages and disadvantages, and at one point my plan for today was just to continue with that, but then I realized I would be allowed three days for the discussion of virtue ethics. <coughs> that seems like a remarkable bad planning. So I didn't want to take up one of those with something else. But partly also, now that we have that in our, in our arsenal, as it were, we can start thinking about that with respect to a variety of more specific questions. So let's get on to the specific questions. There is a style of ethics that is dedicated to the study of virtues and vices, good and bad traits of character. Sometimes these versions of ethics take that question of ethics, what kind of person should I be, as the fundamental question. And so they're addressing virtue because they think everything else reduces to a question about virtues. Other times, people focus on the virtues in a more, you might say, Confucian spirit. Not because they think all questions start there, but they think one body of questions starts there, and it's not simply to be derived from something else. My own view tends to be on the non-reductionist side. I don't think it's the only question or the most basic question in ethics, but I do think it's a basic question. And so it deserves treatment, even if you have the view that questions of norms, questions about rules and principles, uh, and governing action, questions about other things are really independent. So let's take a look at what virtues are. I've just said that virtue is a good character trait. But now as soon as we think about constructing a theory of virtue, we realize there are a lot of good character traits. What are some good traits of character? Honesty. Honesty. What else? Hardworking. Hardworking. Resilience. Resilience. Wisdom. 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 Courage. Insightful. Insightful. Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Good. Now, a lot of these are pretty specifically moral, right? An honest person, a hardworking person, a resilient. I mean, a lot of those have a moral character, but some don't. Exactly. Resilience, for example. Resilience seems like a strength of character. It's a good thing. Is it a moral thing? Suppose someone is easily discouraged. Is that a moral failing? It might be a character failing. But there are lots of features of character that at least don't immediately feel like they have a moral type to them. Think about somebody who is energetic as opposed to someone who's kind of lethargic. Is that a moral difference? Not really, right? Um, or think about other traits of character that we think of as, you know, in some cases, good or bad. So character strengths, you might say. The popular term among positive psychologists who study these things, and we're going to be reading them and discussing them later this week, that's a rather broad category, and it includes all sorts of things, only some of which, at least on the face of it, look like they're moral things, things like honesty, for example, or courage or wisdom, as opposed to, let's say, resilience or being energetic, or a variety of other things. Now, if that's right, then only some of these we think of as having specifically moral tag. That doesn't mean the others aren't important. And in fact, it might be the best way to study them, is to study the whole bunch. But nevertheless, so only some of these feel like, ah, if you don't have that, it's a moral failing, as opposed to just something else um, that would make you a stronger person. But it's not always a morally strong person. Or maybe it ties in with certain moral, moral characters to produce that effect. There's another sort of character strength we're going to discuss when we get to Aristotle, which is an intellectual strength. Okay? Intelligence is a strength, right? So is curiosity. Um, so is maybe you know, being carefully considerate of other people's views and so on. Those are strengths, too. Are they moral strengths? Maybe not, but they seem connected to moral questions. Um, connected to wisdom, for example. Some of them might have a moral character. So in short, there may be some of these that seem like intellectual strengths. And so, so we're going to have to think about what the various dimensions of these are. Moral 
we'll, we'll have to think about what kind of thing a character trait is. Uh, not too long ago, uh, we were part of, <laughs> well, I was part of a committee examining someone who was applying for candidacy for the PhD, wanting to write a dissertation on virtues. And the question was asked in the meeting, what is a virtue? He said, it's a good character trait. Then, you can guess the next question, what's a character trait? The person had no idea what to say. Okay. Um, and so, that, first of all, that's bad. If you're going to write a dissertation on something, you should be able to defy the truth. But the other thing is, yeah, it's not so easy to say what a character trait is. And it's going to make a difference, as we'll see when we get to specific virtues. Well, we're going to look at a variety of different attempts this week. We're going to look at Plato, both the early version of the theory he examines, which I take it is the Socratic view. And it's not just that I take it to be a representation of what the historical Socrates thought. Aristotle took it to be a representation of what the historical Socrates thought. And he was in a much better position to know. <laughs> okay, being, as it were, Socrates' grand student, if I can put it that way. Uh, student of Plato was a student of Socrates, so Aristotle presumably knew from, if not the horse's mouth, at least the horse's student's mouth, uh, what Socrates really thought. And then in his later dialogues, Plato begins to develop his own view and rejects that Socratic picture. Then Aristotle presents his own view, which is somewhat different, and in a sense tries to say, well, both that Socratic view and the Platonic view are right, but in somewhat different senses. In any case, I want to start with the question that Plato asks. Um, in the Lockheed, one of these early dialogues, where he's representing, I think, the views of the historical Socrates. And already starting to, I think, suggest that there's something going wrong. But in any event, the question the Lockheed starts with is, what is virtue? Now here, to answer, well, it's a good character trait, is presumably not enough, right? Because the people are discussing, in the context here, how to educate their kids. And they're thinking, well, okay, we want to educate our children well. We want them not only to grow up to be smart and successful, we want them to grow up to be good people. But in order to determine how to educate someone so they grow up to be a good person, well, we need to know what it is to be a good person. And so the question of what is virtue arises. Presumably, these are the traits that good people have. These are good character traits. But how do you... How do you try to develop something and educate someone for it if you don't even know what it is? So, Socrates asks, what is virtue? What is it to be a good person, in effect? Now, they immediately realize, that's a hard question, right? What is it to be a good person? If you had children, what would you want for them? What character traits would you want them to have? And partly you could answer that with a list, but that doesn't seem terribly satisfying. Um, by the way, once I sat down and said, I'm going to list all the good character traits. I'm going to just see how many in 45 minutes I can think of. And so I started typing this list of character traits. I got to 250 in 45 minutes. Okay? And I wasn't done. I mean, I could have gone on. It's just like, how long am I going to continue to do this? And I was restricting myself to terms in English. Uh, different languages have different concepts of this, right? And so I could have gone on and on. I mean, presumably there is easily a thousand virtues you could list. But it's not very interesting if we say, ah, oh, what are virtues? Well, there are the following character traits. And that list is a thousand things, right? That's not, I mean, it's sort of helpful, but not that helpful. So if we're coming up with a theory of that, what do we do? And what is virtue? Anyway, Socrates says, look, that's a hard question. Let's start with something much simpler. Let's start with just one virtue. Now, in fact, he's talking to a bunch of people after the Peloponnesian War, all of whom had been involved in the war in some way. And they all agreed that part of educating their young boys was to teach them some military arts. And so Socrates says, what's a really important strength for people to have in wartime? Courage. So let's ask a more specific question. What is courage? Hard to address this general question of what virtue is 
thought maybe we can ask what courage is and do a little bit. And so Socrates says, well, what is courage? <laughs> and suppose we agree that part of this anyway is we're going to try to make our young men courageous. What is that? What are we trying to produce? What trait can we Now, we proceed in the course of the dialogue to get three basic definitions. None of them turn out to be very satisfying. So, what is the first definition? It's given by Lachis himself. Lachis had been a general in the Peloponnesian War. Okay. Exactly. Not running away from a fight. Okay? He is a man of courage who stands and fights and does not run away. Now, how is that as a definition of courage? It's, yeah, it's not that great, <laughs> but there it is, stand, fight, not running away. <laughs> now, Socrates is rather condescending in my view. I mean, look, Socra Socrates ended up being put to death, famously, and you get some sense in this dialogue of how that happened, <laughs> in a way, right? I mean, most philosophy professors, I hope, are not as annoying as Socrates. <laughs> we learned a lesson from the way Socrates got treated. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he, he's obnoxious. He basically said, oh, Lachis, yeah, yeah, I don't think you understood my question, okay? Uh, we'll come back to that. But he begins by can say that, but then also looking at why this is not a great definition. Here's one way of thinking about this. We want to imagine the sim well, here, let's think. We immediately have a question, courage. Are we talking about courageous actions, or are we talking about courageous people? Those are two somewhat different targets for our analysis. Presumably, this is talking about courageous action, right? Standing, fighting, not running away. So think about actions. And we might say, let's take this as the set of courageous actions. There are at least two ways <laughs> in which an attempted definition could fail. One is, there might be courageous actions that it doesn't cover. There might also be things that it, that it covers that are not courageous. So you might say, maybe our definition really looks like this. <laughs> Square pain and rat hole or whatever. Okay, and so we might, in short, have some things here that are not courageous, but do fall under the definition. So the definition is going to count them as courage, but they're not. Call those things false positives. Think of us as proposing a test for courage. And the things in this set, they're false positives. They're not really courage, but our definition will count them as courage. And then there are things that really are courageous that our definition is going to exclude. And those things you might think of as false names. We're proposing a test, and gosh, they're going to come out as not courageous under our test, but actually they are. Okay, so that's a problem. Philosophers often say this by saying, well, uh, in this respect, the definition is too broad, it includes too much. In this respect, it's too narrow, it doesn't include quite enough. Um, I like the false negative and false positive a little better just because to say something is both too broad and too narrow to a lot of people sounds weird, right? And, and we want to be able to say both things. You could have false negatives and false positives. Okay, so let's think about this sort of case, standing, fighting, not running away. Do we have false negatives here? Okay, situations where, look, this is really courage, but this doesn't count as courage. In other words, are there cases of courage that do not fall into that definition? That are not cases of standing, fighting, and not. Yeah. There's George Washington during the Revolutionary War who just had ran away from the British continuously while he was waiting for supplies, which was the smart and however courageous thing to do. But clearly he wasn't standing and fighting. Ah, good example, okay? Washington. Yeah, he he was somebody who consistently avoided conflict with the British because he knew the British force was much stronger. He didn't really have many supplies. And so it was constantly a cat and mouse game, and Washington was the mouse, <laughs> avoiding the cat, until finally he was in a position to corner the cat and, and 
win the war. Um, but a huge amount of that involved not standing and fighting and not running away. It actually was running away and trying to get a better position. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, this is along those lines, but you'd also, the Spartans were famous for feigning retreats and then turning around and suddenly everyone was running onto their spears. Um, the Mongols would do similar sorts of things later, except theirs would go over days and days and days of running away. Exactly. Good. Socrates, in fact, talks about this and says, look, even in a military context, and even if we talk about rather specific situations, uh, look how certain battles proceeded. People seemed to retreat, and then what they did is curl around and attack on the flank, so they won that one. That was an instance of courage, and in fact a dramatic one, risky sort of move, but on the other hand, it was something that is no cowardice. So there are times when people really do exhibit courage, but it doesn't involve standing and fighting and not running away. It involves running away to fight on your day, or in this case, fighting by running away and then circling back. Are there other problems with this? I say, I'll symbolize that with this sort of flanking maneuver where you, in fact, do that in the enemy. But what are, what are some other situations where we have courage that isn't of that form? Yeah. Well, like one example, like the Scorcher policy, they didn't even blink, they just literally destroyed the Russian countryside. And I mean, that could, I mean, I'm not saying that could have led to a lot of their agricultural problems later, but in order to not lose to Hitler, which is a good thing, they had to like basically destroy their homeland and their source of food. Okay, good. Look at the Russian strategy in World War II. They recognized that they were in no position to fight the German army. Partly because Stalin had killed almost his entire officer corps in the Great Purge just about three years before. And so you got no generals or colonels or anybody else like that left. You realize you're in a very weak position. What do you do? You just destroy the entire countryside. An incredibly risky move, in a way, because you're destroying your own country. But it meant that by the time the Germans got near Moscow, their supply lines were very, very long. I think it was in early November that the snow started falling. Uh, basically, by then, they were in deep trouble. They had to reach Moscow before the snow fell, or they were sunk. And making that advance difficult by forcing them to keep supplying everything from Germany instead of living off the land slowed things down enough that Stalin was able to win. They ran away in this scorched earth policy, but nevertheless, that turned out to be a highly courageous and effective military response. Now, we've so far been talking about military examples. But are there cases of courage outside of a military context that don't involve that? Yeah. For example, like not running away might be more like complacency. Like it might, for example, I guess, let's say a flood is coming, it might be more, like more courageous to actually, or maybe that's a terrible example, but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> well, no, good. There are these people, right, who um, in the face of natural disasters, they're given evacuation orders, and they decide to stay. Um, one guy was interviewed on the news. The hurricane was coming, you know, why, why aren't you leaving this area on the shore? It's supposedly you'd be a bit of ass evacuated. He said, well, yeah, I heard the emergency thing, so I figured I'd better get out. I'll, I'm going to stay here, but I, I went out to get essential supplies. I bought a case of beer. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> um, he didn't run away, but on the other hand, you might think, yeah, that's not courage. He's just sitting around drinking. A lot of beer. Now, now, in that respect, actually, we don't have a case like this. We have a case of a false positive. He isn't running away, but that's not courage. I don't know what that is. It seems like foolishness. So we also have cases like this, where we end up saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. Staying and facing the hurricane with a case of beer doesn't seem like courage. It seems like, like dumb or complacency or avoidance or something. Yeah. Um, I was going to say back to the case of standing and fighting, it's not necessarily not running away, but um, if you think about it in terms of how to like, raise kids, like back to that, um, if you're raising children with like a partner, there are lots of times when not standing your ground and fighting over the matter and just like letting the other person be in charge ends up as a better result. Um, ah, good, good, good. Yes, in relationships of all kinds, I mean, in, in those kinds of relationships within the family, but also when you're uh, a manager in charge of a group or a politician and so on, one of the most important things to learn is to pick your battles and to pick them carefully, right? There are lots of times where you do not stand in the fight. 
I remember once when I started getting into a fight when I was chairman of this department. And my wife actually said, look, suppose you're right about this. <laughs> As soon as your wife says, suppose you're right, <laughs> you know you're in trouble already. But, but you know, she said, look, even if you're right, um, do you really want to, to get into a fight with somebody who's been an ally of yours? And I realized, yeah, no, I don't. Okay? Uh, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but who cares? My relationship with that person is more valuable than whatever we'd be fighting about. And so there are definitely times when you run away from a fight like that. You avoid it and let the other person have their way. And it's not cowardice. It's just, it's a kind of wisdom, realizing, look, if you fight everything, pretty soon you're going to be fighting all by yourself and everybody else is going to dislike you. Um, and your own strength is going to be sapped. You're fighting a lot of silly fights. And so picking your battles is really important. So that's a case of really saying, look, it's not a lack of courage. You can still be courageous at times to say, yeah, I'm not going to fight. Um, so we get these kinds of military things. We get those picking <laughs> battles. <clears throat> Here we get a case of beer. So it gets on the uh, side of false positives. Other things that are false positives or false negatives. Yeah? Um, I could say courage is vulnerable. vulnerable. Vulnerability, you can't say that word, but like, be vulnerable to someone or like, embracing change or the unknown. So it's like, a lot of times these can make up people say, if you love someone you love them go, but sometimes it's easier to stay in the comfort zone rather than like, embracing change. So that's ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so vulnerability does seem important to courage. Now, there are a couple of things that I think you said I think are important. One of them is just, look, if you're not vulnerable, Um, so what's an example? I mean, sometimes, to go back to a military context, I use this example. You're there, guarding your post, and a group of unruly kindergartners, armed with crayons, come up to the fort and start throwing crayons at you. Yeah, suppose you stand and fight, right? They come up, you battle with crayons, you smash those kids, knock them around, okay? Um, <coughs> Yeah, it's like, hey, glad the Marines taught me man to man combat. Got killed those kindergartners. <laughs> You're like, wait, no, that wasn't courage. I mean, you were not really vulnerable to their attack. Now, I'm careful about picking my example here because actually I know some kindergarten teachers who have suffered terrible abuse. <laughs> and I had some unruly kindergartners, one of whom I've heard stories about was 80 pounds and the size of a fifth grader and had all sorts of mental problems and was highly aggressive. And it's like, yeah, actually, there was vulnerability there, right? And this kid was a, a monster. He was Andre the Giant in kindergarten form. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, but yeah, there's no vulnerability, first of all. There's no real. So actually, notice this doesn't entail vulnerability. And so it feels like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a false positive here if we really have someone who's not vulnerable. But secondly, and this is, I think, the second important thing, sometimes the courage involves in allowing yourself to be vulnerable. And it's not a question of standing and fighting. It's allowing that vulnerability. Suppose you are in an intimate relationship with someone. It can take courage to actually reveal things about yourself you're not that proud of and to reveal that vulnerability. Um, that's courageous, but it doesn't involve standing and fighting. Indeed, it may involve you know, telling the other person a secret or um, sharing something about yourself that makes you vulnerable and so on. That can happen in a romantic relationship or a friendship. <coughs> At times, I think it's a success for leadership in general. The leader who says, I know what to do. You are dumber than me. <laughs> okay, that's one style of leadership. But there's another that says, I completely understand the situation. I've been there too. And that sort of vulnerability in a leader can actually make them much more appealing and make you much more willing to follow because you think they understand you. So, in short, yeah, often that, um, you might say, choosing vulnerability really is courage. Making yourself vulnerable. Other examples, yeah? What about like a situation where 
it just seems kind of like different when you make yourself vulnerable. For example, like maybe someone coming out as being gay versus someone coming out as being a neo Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> ah, oh god, that's interesting. Well, I mean, both of those involve making yourself vulnerable. <laughs> You're just like, um, yeah, I, I just assume. But, but if they feel very different, yes. Um, yeah. And that actually, now that's something that's going to connect with where this is ultimately going. Because one of the questions that's going to bother Plato and Aristotle is, what about these qualities is really dependent on the good? And one of them is independent of that. In other words, does it matter, even go back to the military example, which side you're fighting on? Does it matter whether you are making yourself vulnerable by revealing, let's say, that you are gay, or have a, a sort of minority lifestyle or a minority opinion about something, maybe, or whatever, um, when there, there's no... Uh, moral taint to that. But the other case, you know, gosh, actually, yeah, I'm I'm a neo-Nazi or, you know, um, yeah, gosh, you know, I, I, I actually think that uh, those death camps for millions of people were a good idea or, um, you know, I, I think, pick it. or, you know, gosh, yes, I'm going to make myself vulnerable. I am a mass murderer. I am a serial killer. <laughs> My basement is full of skeletons and stuff. Um, you know, there, it's like, well, yeah, you made yourself vulnerable, right? but it doesn't feel like it's in a cause. I mean, in short, does a moral taint about your ultimate goals or ends or what you reveal or whatever shape this? And one way to think about the problem is just the person who's fighting on what we view as morally the wrong side of a war, the Nazi soldier. Is the Nazi soldier capable of courage in a way that the person fighting on the other side is? That's an interesting question, I think. And as we'll see, the tendency, I mean, so far, it looks like the answer should be sure, why not? But by the time we get to definition three, it's gonna look like the answer that Socrates is giving is not. If you're fighting on the wrong team, sorry, you're disqualified from courage. And so, for that, I wanna table this question, we'll come back to it when we get to that definition. But it's something that should bother us in general. What about the person fighting in a certain way for the wrong kind of cause? The person who in 1859 stood up courageously in Kansas and defended slavery. Um, <laughs> right? Courageously, quote unquote. Is that courage? What is that? Um, it might have been very unpopular. It might have been the question of standing and fighting and not running away. But what do we do with all that? Um, it's not that easy a, a sort of moral question to address. Well, OK. This seems problematic in various ways. And so far, and actually, your example has another nice feature here about the vulnerability, which is, look, this is restricted, it seems, to a military context. But there are all sorts of situations where you exhibit courage in a way that doesn't involve fighting. You might take an unpopular opinion or reveal something up that's going to make you less popular or make you vulnerable and so on. Um, or maybe you get into an argument and you actually don't yield to the other person when you were convinced you're right. You, stick to your guns and defend that position, we'd say that was courageous of you. So there are lots of situations outside this. This seems much too narrow. But it does also seem to include too much. There are false positives. There are cases where it is not legit. And now let's go back to that before we leave that entirely. We've talked about the guy facing the hurricane with a case of beer, um, or the person who's just not vulnerable at all. But think about other reasons someone might stand there at their post and fight without running away when the enemy attacks. Yeah? If a psychopath wouldn't have any fear, I guess that would be more more right, so they, they, they wouldn't have that uh, fear, so they could stand and fight, but it wouldn't be the same as someone who's like, afraid of you and what does it do well? Okay, good. Yeah. I know people have these t-shirts, no fear. And you might think, look, no, no fear, no courage, right? Courage feels like it's a matter of overcoming fear. If you just feel no fear, are you courageous? The people who plunge each other, I, I think they must feel fear because that's what makes it exciting. But suppose you just felt no fear. So, jump off this bridge. Here, we'll attach the singer. Oh, cool. I mean, that's not courage, then. I don't know what that is. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, yeah, there's this horrible story about people who went to bungee jump like that. They forgot the bungee boat. Uh, the bungee cord, but somebody said, well, I got some rope in my back of my truck. 
you know what, they're what happened. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> exactly good. Anyway, now, I mean, it feels as if, wait a minute, if there's no fear, there's no courage. And, and you might think, look, there are other ways in which you might stand and fight. Maybe you stand there and fight because you're so filled with hatred. You're so filled with anger. Maybe you're just a sadist. You're like, yeah, I joined this army so I can kill people. Fight, I get the chance to kill them. Okay, that's like, okay, that's not courage, now that's something else. So, in short, there are all sorts of motives somebody might have. And some of those motives, we might say, yeah, that's not courage, that's some other kind of thing. In any event, so for all these reasons, Socrates says, yeah, this isn't the right kind of thing. Now, one thing he does say is, look, you've given me an example of courage, maybe, but that's not a good definition. I actually think, to be fair to Lockheed's, He's trying to get a definition. It's just that it has problems. Yeah? Well, you're talking about death camps and like at the top of Auschwitz it says R5 mock cry, like where it makes three. And like, could there be like a rational like aspect of fear in that like if you work, like you could like even not really a large chance, but a small like percentage that you could become for you're like the Nazi soldier, like if he fights, there is a small chance that like he could be liberated or his family or even if he wanted his side to lose, like there's a small chance that there'd be like redemption that he could live. So is there some kind of like rationality in that coercion and fear-based mentality? Well, sure. I mean, it, fear is often reasonable. Right? There are things you should be afraid of. And so I, it's not that fear itself is irrational. Also, people do some pretty morally unsavory things because they're afraid, and because they're trying to get some good outcome under very difficult odds. Um, and if you want to take something that isn't really so morally charged to see the point, think about some medical situations where somebody's desperately ill, and you're trying to decide, do you operate or not operate, and so on and so forth. Um, it's like, no outcome here is really very good. And they all, in should introduce, <laughs> or should induce fear in a reasonable person. And you are sometimes doing something that you think, this is kind of a horrible thing to do, but it's, it seems like it's better than the alternatives I face. So, so yeah, I don't think fear is necessarily irrational, and I don't think a lot of responses to fear are necessarily irrational. People can be some, in some horrible situations. Yeah? Yeah, to add on to that, um, I'm thinking about after the 1917 revolution, the Bolsheviks took the czarist officers and took their families hostages and said, you have to fight in our army now or we're going to hurt your families. And so if we're going to take the definition that Socrates gives later, which is you have to be on the right side to be courageous, then that excludes those officers from it. But I think they're actually doing something quite courageous. Because I mean, it seems uh, right. to me at least they're fighting on the wrong side. I'm sure some would disagree, but well, the Bolsheviks weren't all that great. No, right. Okay, good, good. Yeah, Lenin had that sort of strategy, and Stalin followed up, followed up on that in the Second World War. Um, people behind the lines were given orders to shoot anyone who deserted. And people were told, look, not only is it the case that if you run from battle, um, you will be killed, but um, your families will be imprisoned or killed. And anybody who was taken captive by the German army, the idea was, look, you're you're not to be taken captive, you're to fight to the death. And if you're taken captive, then even if you're liberated, you're going to be sent to a prison camp here. You're never going home again. And your entire family will be sent to a prison camp. And that happened to people. People who were taken prisoner by the Germans and then as the Russians advanced were to, you know, reclaimed and liberated by the Russian army, went to prison camps in Siberia. Um, even though I mean, all they did is get captured. But they weren't supposed to be captured, they were supposed to fight to the so you might think Stalin was better than Hitler, and, but whatever you think, I mean, look, that, it was a sort of horrible situation, and whatever you think about the right side or the wrong side, there it feels to me like two wrong sides fighting against each other, one happened to be aligned with us at the time. But in any case, you could say, look, those people were put in an incredibly horrible position, and it doesn't feel like the larger geopolitical situation is even relevant to judging their actions. Yeah? What extent does our idea of what's the right side have to do with who wins? Well, good question. 
How do we tell? What, I mean, presumably, lots of people who are fighting in wars think that their side is the right side. Some might not, and some of those people who don't, we don't blame for various reasons. So, so you're right. I mean, to the extent that we make courage depend on that, you might think we're, we're barking at the wrong tree. But so far, we haven't done that. This definition doesn't do that. And the next one won't. But by the time we get to the third, we're going to be bothered by this even more. Let's move on to the second definition which is what Lockheed gives when he's pressed in this way. He says, well, it's a kind of endurance of the soul. And of course, that's rather vague. It's a kind of endurance. That's like saying a chair is a kind of furniture, you know? <laughs> or a pig is a kind of animal. That's a pretty crappy definition. So Socrates immediately says, well, oh, it's a kind of endurance of the soul. Well, what kind of endurance? <laughs> it's um, a wise endurance of the soul, okay? So, our second definition, wise endurance of the soul. And here, don't get hung up on the word soul. Um, the Greek term for soul, psyche, is, is what we take as the basis of psychology. It means soul or mind. It's, he's basically saying it is a wise psychological endurance. It is a wise mental endurance. Okay. Now, before we get into the details, I want you to recognize something important that's gone on. This definition, standing, fighting, not running away, it's purely behavioral, right? <clears throat> this has to do with something external to me, how I actually act. It has nothing to do with my mental state. And when we looked at the particular examples, notice how many of them had to do with mental state. If you look, you have no fear. If you aren't feeling vulnerable, you don't have any love. And if you have these other unsavory motives. Um, you seem oblivious to the whole situation. Uh, all of those feel like, wait, you're in the wrong mental state. There's something mental. There's something internal as well as external. So in short, this definition is entirely external. And I think Lockheed recognizes, oh yeah, I can't go with something purely external, purely behavioral. So what does he do? He goes with something internal, a wise endurance of the soul wise mental endurance. But now this one is completely internal. Well, again, we want to ask, are there false positives? Are there false negatives? Are there cases of wise endurance that are not courage? And are there cases of courage that are not a wise mental endurance? Yeah? There are many cases of other positive traits that are not necessarily courage following under the definition. Like, somebody can just be resilient. Uh, but that's not exactly what we uh, colloquially mean by courage. Okay, good. Somebody who's resilient. You're here at UT. You're taking courses. You consistently get terrible grades. <laughs> but you're resilient, right? First exam in chemistry. Yes. Say, no problem. I'll work harder. Exam two. F plus. Say, yeah. <laughs> Getting better all the time. <laughs> okay? That third exam. D minus. Yeah. Yeah, on my way, etc. And you just keep on the whole way on that, right? Just every professor is saying, you know, you say, I want to be a doctor. And everybody in all your science classes says, you have no talent for this. <laughs> <laughs> have you thought about art history? <laughs> uh, no, I, I'm bouncing back. I'm going to keep going. Um, at a certain point, you know, first of all, we don't really call that kind of thing courage, right? Now, to some extent, I'm giving you a picture that isn't wise, right? That seems like foolish endurance. But even if it's a wise endurance, let's say these aren't Fs and F pluses, etc. But let's say, you know, you're throughout working hard. It's tough for you. But you endure. You're studying hard. You really want to go to medical school. You're working hard in your biology classes, your chemistry classes, and everything else. You persist. And you're doing it wisely. You've got a good future in this. Still, we call that courage. I mean, maybe. But a lot of persistence, a lot of mental endurance doesn't feel like courage. It feels like it's another admirable quality. It's a good thing, persistence, resilience, etc. But that doesn't seem like courage. Yeah? Could the opposite side of that be, um, let's say you're trying to be wise and you're running out of funds, and if you continue, you're going to go bankrupt. Um, so you have to give up and you don't get to... Um, endure and pursue, um, have to put it off. So it's, I think that's a... Uh, oh, okay, right. There might be, yeah, it might be you can't endure through the fault of your own, I'd say. Um, 
So you're there, uh, gosh, what's a thing in college that does require a lot of endurance? I mean, the whole thing. Yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, you're taking this long three hour exam, right? And you're enduring, you're persisting, and then there's a fire. And all of a sudden, you have to leave. Building, right? You can't finish the exam. Well, what comes? <laughs> no, no, that's not comments, right? Well, they're fault. Or you're going through college, and yeah, the whole thing is a thing that requires a lot of endurance, but you run out of money and have to draw out for a while. Um, it's not a, it's not an indication of a lack of courage, or for that matter, any other character's strength. And so you might say, yeah, well, I wasn't able to endure, but it wasn't my fault. It wasn't a mental lapse of this. So that that seems like um, a problem here. And what kind of problem is it? It's, well, it's a case of saying it's not courage when it really is. So that's a false negative that's coming out. What are some other problems with this definition? Yeah, the word wise seems to make the definition kind of circular. When you say to that, what is wise to do? Well, it's the courageous thing to do. Ah, so now, yes, if we focus on the wise part. So far, we were just focusing on the endurance part. But if you think about the wise part, and this is actually the key to Socrates' objection. You face a dilemma. Either it turns out that, yeah, you're kind of building courage into the wisdom. So you're saying, oh, well, I'll call it wise endurance when it's courageous, <laughs> and you're cheating in that way. Or Socrates is actually worried that, in a way, you're focusing on something that, in some cases, feels like it fights against courage. So here's his example. Uh, let's go back to Lucky's original example. You're there at your post. The enemy is advancing against your position. You're afraid, you're nervous, but nevertheless, you're committed to staying and fighting. Now, two scenarios. First scenario is, you seem stronger than the opposers. You're pretty confident you can hold the fort. Of course, you yourself might be killed, you might lose, but still, you're approaching this with a lot of confidence. You think you can win. Here's scenario two. You think you are the last ditch attempt to buy time for the emperor while he's trying to gather his forces near Beijing. Okay? You're defending the mountain pass against the invading ones. And you recognize your odds of holding your position are very small. But you think, I've got to give people time to get back to Beijing and warn the emperor. And so you're committed to holding your position as long as possible, even though you think your chances of success at this are very slim. Now, which person that first scenario or the second is exhibiting greater courage. Feels like the second. Now who's, but on the other hand, which endurance would we say is wiser? Second. Ah, now there's where we get into the dilemma, right? If we say the second, well good, that's good for this definition. On the other hand, you might say, but look, you're, gonna, you're likely going to die and fail in your mission anyway. Whereas these people are likely to succeed. Isn't it more wise to persist when you think you've got a chance of succeeding than when you think you're going to fail? I mean, it's kind of like that medical school thing. Um, if you think you've got a good chance of succeeding and getting into medical school, that endurance seems wise. If you think you're likely to fail and not get anyway, in any way, well then, it might seem foolish. So doesn't this person seem wiser? But in that case, the wiser the endurance, the less courageous it feels the more insanely foolish and dangerous the situation, the more courage it seems to be. Anyway, that's Socrates' argument. Now, I actually don't know what to say is wise in this situation. I think wisdom's way harder than courage. So my reason for objecting to this is, mm, this is kind of like defining the obscure in terms of the more obscure. I'd rather start with something that feels simple like courage and work towards something that seems tricky and hard like what wisdom. In any event, they reject this. And you might think, look, there's something else that's a problem. Notice we're talking about wise endurance of the soul. That's internal, it's independent of what you do. So suppose the person sees the enemy approaching the path, uh, the pass, and says, <laughs> they look strong and they've got powerful weapons. I'm out of here. But then they endure, they run, and they they do a marathon running all the way back, right? They're like, yeah, I don't know how far fast that army is advancing. I better keep running. And they run, they run, they endure. It's pretty wise to do that because man, that army could be anywhere. That's like 
Yeah, that's not courage. <laughs> it must be a wise endurance. It is not courage. So, we move on to the last definition. And the last definition is now knowing the grounds of fear and confidence. David Ben-Gurion summarized this as knowing what to fear and what not to fear. Knowing what is the greater thing to fear, the greater danger. Is it death or is it dishonor? Is it your own personal safety or is it the safety of your nation? And so, now, that seems like a good definition. But two things, to, and in fact, Nicias gives this once Lachis gives up, um, and he's quoting something he had heard from Socrates. However, Nicias, by this point, I should tell you, is somebody who led a disastrous military expedition during the Peloponnesian War. And so, it's kind of, I mean, we don't really have anybody who's quite like that in American history, like the general medicine. But, you know, if we did, it'd be like, oh, that guy says this. So immediately, this casts a certain pall on it, right? But you think, okay, well, what about that one? Now, notice, too, it's about no. This one, too, is entirely different. So, we've got one minute left. Objections. <laughs> False positives <laughs> and negatives. Yes? Um, I would say knowing is different from doing. You can know and not do it. Exactly. We have to say, wait a minute, knowing is not the same as doing. Now, as we'll see next time, there is another objection here. But Plato, in his more mature thought, says, look, that's the key objection. You, if I know what I ought to fear, and I run away anyway, I say, yes, dishonor is more to be feared than death. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> I don't count as courageous. I've got to actually do it. And so next time we'll look at Plato with the Republic and start with this question the difference between knowing 